Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Lanny and the Family Way, we want to say thank you for coming out this afternoon and our paying respects and uh, being of support uh, to the family as we uh, remember Jane. Now, for those of you that know Jane, why you know that she was not one for a lot of formalities, so she's probably wondering why in the world you're all sitting in rows and why you're not just milling about, you know, kind of in a, you know, uh, caucus kind of way that would make a lot more sense to her. So, nonetheless, why we're grateful that you are here. Let me offer just an opening prayer as we begin. Gracious God, we thank you for your marvelous gift of life. We appreciate the fact that we have had the opportunity to share life with Jane. We thank you for all the ways that uh, she was unique and special and for the way in which she so warmly and generously shared her life with others. We pray that as we gather and reflect that your spirit will be among us, that you'll surround each member of the family with your gracious care that your kindness and your love will always be a part of the lives that we share together. We ask this knowing that it is your gracious hand which sustains us in your holy name. Amen. Well, as I was thinking about uh, the request that Lanny made of asking if I would kind of coordinate things today, I'm never one to turn down an opportunity to stand in front of people, so, you know, here I am. Um, and for that, why I appreciate the, the inquiry and the request. And so it was a lot of fun to listen to the stories that um, the boys and others have shared with me, as well as uh, the reflections that Lanny and I have had together. One of the things that we reflected upon was, you know, what's, what was life like? Life goes by so quickly that oftentimes we don't stop and uh, take note of some of the things that happened. And so I did a little bit of research on what life was like in the year 1950 when Jane was born. For those of you that are fully aware of history, why you know that Harry Truman was president what you probably don't remember, though, is that Truman was the first president to do a televised speech that was broadcast across the entire country on TV all at the same time that year. I found that to be rather interesting, given the fact that we don't think anything at all about that today. When we think about what life was like back then, why, uh, for those of you who like to eat, why bread cost 14 cents a loaf. So just in case while you're wondering what that slice of bread costs today, why it might be a little more than that 14 cents. One of the things that was true when Jane was five years old, why um, that was when Rosa Parks refused to get up off of the bus. So there are lots of things that shaped her life uh, that indeed, why all in all of our lives, why things that shape us and develop who we are. Jane was an avid reader, one of the authors that was very um, prominent at the time of her birth. Why was Norman Vincent Peale and Thomas Costain and William Faulkner? Uh, so you know some of those why you know, now are those marvelous books that uh, you have to read when you're in school uh, as a matter of, of uh, you know, grounding and, and uh, uh, formant uh, formanting who we are. One of the things that, you know, I've always wondered, because you hear about it these days when we talk about the Pledge of Allegiance, that it was in 1950 that the phrase, under God, was added to the Pledge of Allegiance. So she was born in a most unique year. I grew up in the western part of the state of Nebraska, and uh, we had two movie theaters, one where you could go in and sit down, and one where you sat in your car. Well, 
come to find out why 1950 was really about the time that drive-in movies became real popular. One of the things in terms of uh, fun things to do that seems to be coming back these days is the hula hoop, which was introduced as one of the activities for youngsters at that particular time. Now one of the interesting pieces is, is that every uh, parent that I know why laments what their children bring home from school. What are they talking about? What is that language that they're using? Slang is what we oftentimes say it is. Well, in the 1950s, why some of the slang words that were used were baby and bread and burn rubber and chariot and cool it and go ape. And quite honestly, they use the word rap, although it has a very different meaning today. In terms of clothing, why I thought it was pretty interesting that it was Bill Blass that introduced blue jeans about 1950, which was something that I found to be interesting. Now, by the time she's 10, why the things that are coming about, why are miniskirts and uh, hot pants and go-go boots? I'm not sure whether that was ever part of Jane's wardrobe, but yeah, I guess it's possible. Um, well, with those kinds of things, why, let me share with you uh, the life reflections that are in your pro uh, program for this day. Jane was born on January 4th, 1950 in La Junta, Colorado, to Joseph and Dorothy Foster of Manzanola, Colorado. Jane was baptized in Manzanola Methodist Church on Easter Sunday of 1950. She graduated from Manzanola High School in 1967, attended CU in Boulder, and worked in Denver. Upon returning to Manzanola in 1971, why she met Charles Lanny Munson, a teacher at the high school. They were married in Littleton, Colorado on October 1st, 1972. Lanny continued to teach. They lived there in Manzanola. And Jane attended Otero Junior College and taught piano and guitar. They had two sons. In 1978, they moved to Northern Colorado, settling in Windsor while she attended CSU in Fort Collins. There they had their third son. Lanny's job with Union Pacific brought them to Omaha in 1985. Jane eventually became a self-taught computer programmer, a systems analyst working for the 1990 Census, First Tier Bank, World Travel Center, Lab Interlink, and Lincoln Financial Group. She retired in 2010. After a year-long fight with cancer, why she died on July 3rd of this year. She is survived by her husband, Lanny, her sons, Jonathan and Michael, his wife, Michelle, all of Omaha, his son Clark, his, his wife Allison, and their granddaughter Ada of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Sisters Betty, her husband Nicholas Macarus, and Mary Ann, her husband James McLean of Denver. Sister Jolene, her husband James Eckert of Greencastle, Pennsylvania. Nieces, nephews, cousins, and many other relatives and friends who love her. It is with deep appreciation for her life and for the life that you have shared with her that we say thanks to God this day. So we'll pause now as we listen to the song, The Prayer. Just where we go and help us to be wise in times when we don't know. Let this be our prayer as we go. with your grace. 
give us faith so we'll be safe. We pray we'll find your light and hold it in our hearts. When stars go out each night, Remind us where you are. Let this be our prayer. When shadows fill our day, lead us to a place. Guide us with your grace. Give us faith so we'll be safe. of the things that we felt would be most appropriate would be for folks to be willing to share some of the unique parts of your life that you shared with Jane. So this is a little bit like, you know, one of those uh, television programs where somebody walks around with a microphone. Uh, is there someone that would like to share um, a story that of your life together with Jane? We don't have to be bashful. We just need somebody that's willing to be brave enough to be first. Um, my name is Nancy, and I'm the daughter of Roland and Lois Christensen. And Lois is Lanny's older sister. And they live in San Antonio. And they couldn't be here today, but Mom sent an email, and she asked um, for me to read it. So she says... Did you ever see Jane frustrated? I did. In the early 1980s, Roland had to go to Denver on business. We thought it would be a great time for me to visit Lanny and family. They were living in Windsor. I don't remember the month, but I do remember it was cold. Now the frustration shows up. Clark was an active toddler and would just not keep his clothes on. Jane would dress him, and in minutes, he would be stark naked. <laughs> she was frustrated, exclamation point. I don't know how she solved her problem. He was still active as ever and enjoying his freedom when we returned to San Antonio. I presume the problem is solved. <laughs> Wonderful memories, Aunt Lois. Hi, 
I'm Leanne, another niece. Um, okay, so, well, for me, I guess I'll cry first, and then I can get through this. Um, well, for me, it must have started somewhere on the back of a horse. Riding double with my Aunt Jane's arms and legs wrapped around me. She began to teach me how to balance life, and she never stopped. Many a time I set off on Chico only to have Chico, that was her horse, return home before me. <laughs> Follow your horse either on or off, and you can always find your way back to the barn. As a teenager, my very typical life was full of lilting to the left or the right as I tried to find my way. As I was growing up with Jane in Manzanola, she showed me in a very real way that if you stand up straight with both feet evenly weighted in the stirrups, then rock back and forth just right, your saddle and your life will come back to center. When I was trying to find my way as a young adult, Jane told me that Wyoming was a good place to live. You don't have to pay state income tax. <laughs> and I could always keep my horses nearby. It was during this phase of life that I experienced some pretty unexpected and very quick turns around the barrel. Lean forward, give your horse his head, and you will come out of the turn at a full-on gallop as you're bringing her home. My Aunt Jane was always there for me, never judging, but always listening. Kids, marriage, divorce, parents. I really could tell her anything. Many a time I found myself riding bareback without a saddle for support. Squeeze your legs, grab a handful of mane, and hold on for dear life. <laughs> Over the past year, I really admired Jane's endurance as she showed us all what real queens are made of. Life going downhill, lean back. Life going uphill, lean forward, take in the smells, hug your horse's neck, and appreciate how hard they are working for you. Want life to slow down a bit? Lean back on your pockets, exhale, and walk on. At the end of every ride, you know it's been a good one. When you get off your horse, your butt is sore. The inside legs of your jeans are covered with horse hair. I always slide the saddle off my horse, and as I'm brushing him down, I've always thought of my Aunt Jane. It's at those moments that I always thought that she would be proud of me. And I know that that will never stop. Brush under the belly where the cinch goes. Pick, pick the rocks out of their feet. Give them treats. Give them plenty of water. And your horse will be with you forever. Thank you. Anyone else want to share at this time? I mean, I don't want to, if someone else wants to, I don't want to hog it. But um, my sister's name is Jane. And when Jane and Lanny were married in family discussions, you know, rather than uh, Jane Foster or Jane Munson, we came to, to refer to her simply as Lanny's Jane. Lanny's Jane. And so um, I wrote a poem, a little poem, and I'd like to read it today. And it's called Lanny's Jane. The gates of heaven have opened to welcome one so dear. And though we do not see her, we'll always feel her near. Her laughter and her tender ways will help us through our darkest days. For Lanny, a loyal and perfect companion. His love, his life, 
his only one. So proud of her boys, John, Mike, and Clark, and on the world, they'll leave their mark. Her girls, Michelle, Allison, and Ada, hold the legacy to build strong branches on this family tree. For all of us left here behind, a spirit of love will brilliantly shine and forever in our hearts remain. We love you, Lanny's Jane. Thank you. Did Jody have a chance to? Jody, would you like to speak? Um, I just want to say how touched I am to see so many people here. It's really a tribute to Jane. And um, a lot of you don't know me. I'm Jody. I'm the third foster sister. I'm the one that inherited the short foster genes as opposed to the tall Clark genes. <laughs> so I'm glad I'm not standing there. Uh, but uh, I didn't really intend to be a featured speaker, and I'm really nervous. <laughs> so um, I decided that I would talk to you about a time in her life when almost nobody here knew her, when she was a little girl growing up in our valley in Colorado in the little town of Manzanola, and on into her teen years when she and I were the only ones who were still living in the valley. <coughs> and uh, so that's what I want to talk about, and I want to tell you one thing. It just occurred to me, I should say, we were raised in a very strong southern um, background. And growing up, we called our father Daddy. And when I was about 40, somebody said to me, Jody, it's kind of strange to hear you t call your father Daddy. But we didn't think anything about it. That's what we did. And I probably will lapse into that <laughs> sometimes. So I wanted to warn you, I'm 69 and I still call my father Daddy. <laughs> but um, my first memory, and this is actually a memory I have, of when Jane was born, was our father telling us, this was daughter number four, that someone in Manzanova said to him, what are you trying to do, Joe, put together a girls basketball team? <laughs> <laughs> but um, we knew better. We knew that each addition to our family was part of the search for the elusive Joseph Walter Foster III, <laughs> who never did show up. And uh, instead, what our daddy got were three piano-playing girly girls. And with this fourth daughter, another piano-playing girly girl, only this one would be the child of his, of his heart. Because this was the little girl who would pull on her blue jeans and pick up her gun, and it was her gun, and go out with him to the fields to tromp through the fields and try to scare up doves or cottontails or whatever would end up being Sunday dinner at our house. She was his hunting buddy. And she wasn't a little girl trying to just please her dad. It's who she was. She loved it. She really did. And when I think of the two of them, the bond that they had was, I think the greatest bond they had, had to do with animals. And I searched pretty hard to try to find the words because it's kind of complicated. They didn't have what normal people do in relationship to animals. We have pets that capture our hearts and, and that's kind of how we relate to them. Their viewpoint about animals was much wider, much broader. And um, I think that it was, the way I would characterize it is that it was very firmly based in reality. It wasn't what I call a Disney-fied version, um, a way to look at animals. It was, it was totally real. I want to tell you a quick story about Jane that I think kind of demonstrates this. It was the last time I visited her 
here in Omaha. And we were at her kitchen, looking out the window at the bird feeder. And Jane told me a story about a squirrel. They welcome squirrels at their bird feeder, and I like that. <laughs> um, but this squirrel tried to do what squirrels do. He tried to jump from the top of one tree to the top of another tree in the yard, the backyard, and it didn't make it. Fell to the ground and had a broken back. And this was an animal in real distress, really hurting. And Jim, I need that water. <laughs> and so Jane called the Humane Society. Thank you, Lenny. Look, I'm shaking. <laughs> anyway, so they came out, a lady came out, put the squirrel in a cage, and put on her best compassionate Humane Society face and came up to Jane and said, I hate to tell you this, but they may not be able to save the squirrel. And Jane said, lady, if I still lived where I could take my shotgun to my own backyard and use it, you would never have been called out here. <laughs> and you know Jane, you know she wouldn't have flinched. She would not have hesitated if she had had it in her power to put that animal out of its misery. She would have done it. But I don't want to mislead you. Both my father and Jane were total soft-hearted pushovers when it came to their pets. I mean, they could cuddle and coddle with the best of us. <laughs> and so again, the viewpoint here went all the way from animals and their part in the food chain to the pets that steal our hearts, and then another group of animals. And these animals were a little bit above. They were just a little higher up in the respect scale. Because these were animals that, due to their breeding, can form partnerships with people. They can become part of a team with a human being. And um, I often think the, one of the very few status symbols that my dad ever had was a Chesapeake retriever named Buster. And Buster was a really incredible animal. He was very strong, had a really soft mouth. This was the dog that loved to go duck hunting. And uh, they knew about him in the valley. He had a reputation. All the sportsmen knew about Buster and what a great retriever he was. And that was a source of great pride to my dad. And uh, so in this world of animals, it certainly was no surprise when Jane came to her father and said, I want a horse. But when she first made that request, she was really little. And I can see my dad kind of silently groaning, thinking, and remember this is the apple of his eye. She's so little and horses are so big. So he went out and bought her the safest horse he could find. This was, I don't know this horse's name, but it could have been the old gray mare. This was decrepit, sway back, <laughs> one step away from the glue factory, pathetic animal, and Jane loved that horse. <laughs> she just loved that horse. She'd come home after school, get on this horse. I don't think she even had a saddle. And they'd walk from the house to the barn, to the house, the barn being Betty's old root beer stand with the fence around it. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, at some point, my dad realized that this was not just some passing fancy. Jane really did love horses. So he began to think about the horse upgrade. And uh, that's when he bought Chico. And those of you who know Spanish know that Chico means little boy. And he was a small horse. But what my dad didn't realize is that small horses can be very feisty. And Chico was. So Jane was no longer walking sedately on her horse because Chico could trot. And when she took him out on the country roads, Chico could gallop. And whereas my dad had bought Chico because he envisioned the distance between a horse's back and the rock hard ground, Jane began to experience that distance <laughs> on Chico. And um, I'm not exactly sure how the rest of this story came about, but I, I know the facts, basics. There was a man in our town 
who when he was younger had been in the rodeo. And he had two boys, they were about Jane's age. And behind his house, he had set up the dimensions for a rodeo arena. And Jane caught his eye on Chico. And he began to teach her how to barrel race. And I assume, being a Western crowd, everybody here knows what the barrel race is? Mm-hmm. <laughs> OK. Um, so I think he may have had something to do with the next torch upgrade. Because I think he may have gone to my dad and said, Joe, she needs a quarter horse. So this was when Mandy came into her life. And Jane began to experience what I was talking about in the partnership between an animal and a person. Mandy was bred to run. And Mandy was competitive. And Jane was competitive. Uh, and rodeo is not a leisure sport. And that distance from the horse's back was something that Jane experienced so much that she actually ended up with permanent damage to her kidneys. But she loved it. I mean, she wouldn't have done anything else. And we went to see them a few times. Saturday night rodeo in La Hanta. And they were good, Jane and, and Mandy. They were very good. And um, eventually, she gave up the idea of a career in barrel racing. And she met that nice young school teacher from Manzanola. And she moved on. But this was a time of her life that she always looked back on with a lot of joy. It was a really happy time for her. So I've got something I want you to do for Jane. And you can close your eyes if you want. You don't have to. But I want you to imagine a Colorado sky, OK? If you don't know what it is, a Colorado sky is incredibly big. You can see the horizon. And it's unbelievably blue. You have to kind of ratchet up your technicolor here, OK? Now to the corner of your vision, I want you to see a good-looking roan quarter horse. And she is coming in at a full gallop. She's got her head and her neck extended. And on her back is a little girl, slim, curly blonde hair. And her body is bent forward from the waist so it's in a line with her horse's neck. And on her face, there's a grin as big as that Colorado sky. I want you to see it. I want you to feel her joy. And thank you for letting me talk about my sister. And um, I have something for everybody here. It's a picture of Jane and Mandy. My husband took it in the front yard of our house at Manzanola. Beautiful scenic Manzanola in the background. And it's really cool because she's got on her Manzanola Bobcat sweatshirt. And I have a lot of prints. So anybody who wants one, come and see me after the service. And I'll be glad to give you one. And Lanny, <laughs> this one is yours. Thank you, Jody. Mike. Okay, this is a uh, letter sent in by uh, cousin Vicki Wingo Grant. Um, she couldn't make it, so she wanted somebody to read this. Um, she says, I think of a sequence in Lord of the Rings when I think of Jane. Frodo says, I wish none of this had happened, Gandalf. So do all who live to see such times, but that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. Over the years, Jane was able to maintain her humor, her fierce love of family, and not allow cancer to rule all. Her mental toughness, her dedication to carving out room 
for what was important to her was awe-inspiring for me. Jane found her sweet spots. She showed me grace and demonstrated how to move from one small place of beauty or wry humor to the next. With those dear to her, bearing up under, while bearing up under the tremendous burden placed on her body and her health. If that is not heroic, I don't know what is. My thoughts and love are with you and Jane's life celebration. Thanks. Thank you. Is there someone else that would like to share a story? <coughs> Jane and I worked together for a while at a company called Lab Interlink. Um, it was a startup company. If anybody's worked there, you realize you, you would know that anytime you're working for a company that really doesn't know what it is yet, there's a lot of hours working there. You go a lot of wrong directions. You wind up coming back around to the same place you started. Um, so working with Jane was really good because she kept her sense of humor, as we all tried to do. Um, and we both pretty much acknowledged that it was probably the best group, most talented group we'd ever worked with in our lives. Um, still believe that. Um, interesting thing with Jane and I, uh, <coughs> she, was a she and I were political opposites. I was a... <laughs> Oddly enough, I mean, I'm a staunch conservative, and she is a bleeding heart liberal, and we, we acknowledged that right off the bat and said, we'll just agree to disagree, and I do remember she used to work um, on the campaigns here and used to complain that, it, you know, in Omaha, it was like whistling in the wind trying to get a Democratic candidate <laughs> elected, so anyhow, so we put that, that aside, and decided we started what we call the BBC. Uh, because of all the long hours, et cetera, the BBC was the Black Beer Club. We used to go, we found out that uh, instead of talking about politics, let's talk about Guinness, which we love to drink. <laughs> so we very much enjoyed that, and brought other people into that club. Used to meet periodically at um, several of the taverns um, around Lab Interlink and really enjoyed that. Um, even the last time I saw her, we were both drinking dark beer together, so. Our other uh, enjoyable acronym was the SOI, which is Sons of Italy. When things got at their darkest at Lab Interlink and the hardest, uh, we used to meet for lunch, go down to the Sons of Italy for lunch on Thursdays as a group. So I really appreciated uh, all her humor and fun, and I'll miss her. Someone else? Mark, are you willing to read? Oh, I don't know how much preface to give to this. Um, I lived in Japan for the first time 10 years ago, and it was Mother's Day, and I knew I needed to send something, and back then, calling America from Japan cost you like $30. It was absurd. You had to go to the, to the corner store and get a, a phone card and then type in 35 numbers, and then you could call your parents. But uh, I gave her a call, too, but um, that was short, and uh, I needed to send her a letter, so I sent her a letter. Um, and well, I'll just go into, uh, this is a different letter. I wrote this uh, June 24th. Dear Mom, about 10 years ago, I wrote a letter to you for Mother's Day where I explained a few of the ways that you have influenced me. Tonight, I felt like writing a part two of that, so here goes. One of the things I've most admired about you is that you're strong. You are flexible to see both sides of any issue, but once you've seen enough to make a choice, you are adamant and you're steadfast. Whether it's politics, family matters, the people around you, or just you yourself, no one's going to call you wishy-washy. Once you've made a choice, we know it and we know why Mm. Oh, and we know why, right? Sorry, don't have part two listed down here. I think that might be why I like transparency in decision making. You always laid out a good reason for everything, and it helps us all make choices quickly and decisively. I don't want anybody holding it close to the vest if that's going to affect me. It's not fair, and it's a waste. 
Also, your desire for fairness has affected me. I think you've told a whiny me that life isn't fair before, uh, but it's not, and it never will be. Uh, however, that doesn't mean we can't try and make things more fair in everything we choose. If there's one consistent thing that bothers me about, sorry, about conservative politics, <laughs> <laughs> it is the unlevel playing field that is almost always encouraged and sought out in so many ways. I don't mean to get all political here, but it's kind of hard to write about you and not get some jabs in there. Uh, your desire to make things fair so everyone has a chance at what they want shows in all of the people you support, the beliefs and stances you take, and in the way you live your life. You don't want to see anyone get screwed over and you yell when you see someone doing it to somebody else. That's definitely something I feel strongly about, and I hope I act on that the way you have throughout my life. And one other thing I want to write about that goes both along with and against what I've written so far is that you're really, really, really good at being soft when the time is right. One doesn't have to be tough and decisive all the time. It's better if you can recognize when things are going to be hard or bad and say, well, it sucks, and there's not much you can do about it. You've got to pick your battles and not fight when it's not worth it, or when there will never be a winner. I feel like my choices and what to fight for, and when to just say, okay, are heavily influenced by watching you. And I'm grateful to have you as a model. I love you so much. I'm so lucky you're my mom. Thank you. John, do you want to share? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I, uh, I've been trying to decide what I was going to say about it. And Clark pretty much did it. Um, Mom was the greatest influence in my life. Um, if you guys know me, and I think almost everybody here does, um, <sighs> I can't say enough good things about her. I brag about her. And there's not many people that can say that they actually brag about their parents. But I do, and I always have. And there's nothing that she could have done to me or to anybody else that would have been ill-intended. She didn't like hurting people. She didn't like hurting feelings. She was so sensitive and really strove to make sure that us three boys were the same way. Um, and I think she did a good job of it, and I think the amount of people here are a good testimony to that. Um, she loved animals. <laughs> you know, she gave me that love. She was really smart music. You know, if you all know that I'm obsessed with music, and that comes from her. Um, she's just uh, one of those women that just, you know, she loved her kids so much, and she loved her family so much, and I never once thought that she wouldn't drop everything for me. Just to hear her voice when I'm upset. If I could just hear her respond to me right now, it would make it better. But I can't, and I've got to accept that. I know she's here. I just can't give her a hug, you know? <laughs> That's what sucks. But, uh, yeah, I, uh, I guess kind of a funny story. When, um, when I came out, she was the first person I told. Not many people can say that. And <laughs> I told her it was kind of crappy. I told her over her lunch break. Because I, <laughs> I, <laughs> I knew she'd have to go back to work. <laughs> and I didn't want to have to talk about it forever. And so I sat her down and explained where I had been for the last week and told her that, you know, my mom, I, I, I'm gay. And she puts her hand in her head and she looks up and she goes, honey, you don't want to deal with men. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you know, Mom, I, I, don't, I don't think I have a choice. And she's like, well, I love you anyway, you know. And she's like, just let us know where you are. And that's all she's ever wanted, is to know where I am. And I know she's here. So now we're equal, I guess. I love you all. Thank you very much for coming.
marvelous reflections. Does anyone else want to share? All right, John, you're really brave. I, <laughs> I don't like crying in public. <laughs> so I, I didn't know if I was going to say anything, but uh, uh, you've kind of inspired me. So um, I'm Jane's daughter in law, I'm Clark's wife. Um, we've been married about five years, but I feel like I've been like part of this family for at least a decade, probably more. Um, so uh, this is my dad. <laughs> my dad uh, used to, well, still works for Delta. He's retiring in December. Yay. Um, <laughs> but uh, due to him working for Delta, I used to be able to fly for free um, at the drop of a hat at any time. Um, I used to be able to just call a phone number. And then if there were enough seats on the flight, I would just get on the flight. And if there was a seat in first class, I would sit in first class. And uh, you know, even though I'd be like a 19-year-old who did not deserve to be in first class. <laughs> um, and so uh, every year during college, I came to Omaha at least four times. So I would come once during Christmas and three times, exactly three times every single summer, at least once during the Taste of Omaha, every single year. And sometimes I would only give the months of like 24 hours, sometimes 12 hours. Like I would just show up <laughs> and, and stay in their house and eat their food. And uh, no one ever complained to me. No one ever made me feel unwelcome. No one ever made me feel like, you know, like once I felt like a part of a family, I was always part of the family. I was never inconvenient. I was never in the way. Um, you know, there was always a place for me, even though I was just this girl who flew in from Atlanta that morning. Um, and uh, you know how the Munsons collect all of the Munson siblings, girlfriends, and boyfriends over the years. <laughs> and, and luckily, Clark's pretty much uh, from adulthood onward only had me as a girlfriend, so that's good. <laughs> um, so, um, and I always get told um, by people, I guess, who don't know the Munsons that I train Clark very well because Clark cooks a lot and Clark cleans a lot. And really, I have done nothing. Like, I'm. I'm way worse than he is. <laughs> um, and, uh, and really, it was uh, Ma and Pa Mumpson who uh, showed Clark that you actually have to like, pick up after yourself and keep things clean. And like, you know, if you see something that's messed up, it's not someone else's job. It's your job. And because of that, I live a great life right now. So thank you. <laughs> I have a very happy marriage, <laughs> I think, as a result of that. Um, and so Jane and I, I think, always had a special relationship, or at least I like to think that. Um, Jane and I are both software engineers. Um, we both see eye to eye on a lot of things. Not everything. I like frippery probably a lot more than she does, and, and pretty things. But, <laughs> um, but uh, I know when I was at my first startup and it was tanking, she saw that it was tanking a few months before I did. And she said, oh, your paychecks are going to stop. And I was like, no, 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 no. They're going to keep paying me at least for the next couple of months. There's got to be that much money around. But she knew the next month that that paycheck was not going to come. And oh, boy, was she right. <laughs> and because she told me that, I had freshened up my resume. And I think uh, I had a new job before anybody else in the company and uh, was out of there pretty quick thanks to some good advice and I'm sure some life experience that Jane was able to share for me from her uh, past startup experiences. Um, and we'd talk so much. Um, Clark would have summer jobs. And so I'd just be there by myself with Jane and Lanny. And Jane and I would just talk for hours and hours while Clark made sandwiches at Subway. And I feel like. <laughs> <laughs> he makes me sandwiches, though. It's pretty good. <laughs> um, so I am also a mother of currently the only Munson grandchild. Um, I am Ada's mom. Um, so uh, we called all of our parents and told them when we were pregnant pretty quick. Um, and uh, my parents were like, oh, that's great. Like, they already have one grandchild. So they're, they're very happy for me. They were very pleased. Um, but, uh, and uh, Lanny was very happy. But I think, uh, let me quote Jane. Ah! <laughs> that's what she said when she found out. <laughs> so... Uh, she was really excited to have a grandchild. Um, and until about 20 weeks, we didn't know whether it was a boy or a girl. And my mother is an ultrasonographer. Um, and so um, she'll peek in your uterus a little bit and, <laughs> and tell you as soon as she can whether it's a boy or a girl. Um, and this is kind of like a family tradition that we go to Atlanta. And my mom will like 
you know, just give you sort of the lowdown on the kid. Uh, before you have your real ultrasounds, you can be all smug and tell them that you already know. <laughs> um, and so Jane and I flew down to Atlanta from Pennsylvania together, just the two of us. Um, and uh, we went and saw the ultrasound together. And, you know, there's Ada had the hiccups and she was wiggling around. But it was pretty clear that we were having a girl. And, and like, uh, Jane was just like, <gasps> oh, again. <laughs> And we kind of like, we were kind of quiet for a while, and then we just kind of like jumped up and down and hugged each other and like went a little crazy. Uh, like I thought, I don't know, I'd con I was convinced that I was having a boy. Um, and, but like Jane was just like, oh, girl, yes. Because <laughs> I think she'd been waiting about 30 years to have a girl in the family. <laughs> um, and she has one. Um, I'm so sad that she's not going to get to know her grandmother growing up. Um, and. I don't think any other future months we're going to have to do work really hard to make sure they know all the wonderful things about Jane. Um, and you know, I promise to make sure that she has all the books she could ever want. I promise that she'll learn how to ride a horse. <laughs> you know, I promise that she will be a self-sustaining woman <laughs> who will know how to make her own money. She will have piano lessons, <laughs> um, and uh, hopefully, we'll learn how to at least grow food or something together. Like, I have chickens. That's, that's the best I can do. I know she slaughtered lambs out on the prairie. And, <laughs> and we really can't do that. So maybe we'll collect chicken eggs, and that'll, <laughs> that'll be good enough, maybe. But um, I just I want to say I love, I love being a Munson so much. I'm so happy to be a part of this family. I feel really special that I've had this chance. And you know, I want to thank you guys for being here. Um, and thank you so much for the love for my mother-in-law. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to share? I just have a couple stories. Um, one was a early one. Uh, you've heard about mom's uh, kind of strength as being a strong woman. and. Back when we were younger, we did get spankings every now and again. It was usually about safety, you know. We would, we would try and go run out into the street, and there was a car, and she'd pull us back and give us a good spanking to let us know that that's not cool. And, uh, or otherwise, we'd get a spanking, and we really, really, really deserved it. Um, this one time, I, uh, Dad was at work, and I was just being a, just a horrible little, probably four-year-old, and just obnoxious and she kept saying I don't know Mike I think we're gonna have to have dad spank you and then I was like so I don't care and you know I was just being I was just being such a bad little boy and then finally she was just like all right I think I have to spank you I'm like well that, that doesn't matter you're just a girl I almost died when she spanked me I my legs were broken I couldn't move. I, I, it was so, so bad. So from then on, I learned women can be just as strong as men, if not stronger. And uh, my wife is definitely a testament of a strong woman. So uh, I'm glad I found her. The uh, other story I have is when I was uh, in first grade, I, I got called down to the principal's office, and I was a good kid, you know, I did everything right, and I just had to run a, a message down to the principal's office, and the principal's office was right next to the, uh, uh, um, to the uh, nurse's office, you know, and I hear this crying coming from the nurse's office, and the vice principal knew me, and I, I was like, what's going on in there? And the vice principal said, well, some children just aren't as lucky as you are to have such great parents and I knew that that kid was going through a lot and I knew that I was so lucky to have the parents that I do that did and I just want to say thank you dad thank you mom for being great parents I love you both Anyone else like to share? Okay. Well, to wrap up this time, 
why. Let me share just a couple words from a psalm that I think addresses many of the things that we've heard. In the first two verses of Psalm 104, why the psalmist says this, O oh my soul, bless God. God, my God, how great you are, beautifully, gloriously robed, dressed up in sunshine, and all heaven stretched out for your tent. It goes on to describe the marvelous creation and the wonder of sharing that creation with humanity. So we've heard stories that have marked us as part of that marvelous creation and that marvelous gift of life that we have shared with Jane. And for that, why we are deeply grateful and thanks, and thankful for all that God has done. And so to kind of capture that in a song, before you on your seat when you sat down, why was a song entitled On Eagle's Wings. We invite you to join in singing that as a tribute. So it is into the palm of God's hands that we entrust Jane for eternity, and we trust that your grace, O oh God, will surround each of us for this time that we've shared together, why we pray that uh, your strength would be a part of each member of this family, and that uh, your grace will be sufficient for the day. These things we pray. Amen. Now. Since you've been all here so nice and neat, why Jane would really appreciate it if you'd get up and move around and do a little bit of caucusing and telling stories. Um, and uh, uh, I know that uh, Lanny would love to hear as many of those stories as you can share with him as well as the boys. So please be gracious in doing that. There are drinks at the back. Uh, please feel free to stop uh, and uh, enjoy the time together. Thank you on behalf of the family. Also, you should know that the uh, gardens is for you to peruse for the rest of the day. It's open till 5 o'clock, and you're welcome to go down and, and see anything in the Lorenzen Gardens that you can't care to. Uh, there's a wonderful model train exhibit down there. Believe me, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, feel free to, to there's um, soft drinks, coffee, tea, some wine for you that want to do so and um, uh, go out on the patio, enjoy the, the wonderful day we have, and I really, really, really appreciate everyone being here. Thank you. <laughs>